Good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome. Before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh peoples on whose traditional territories we're privileged to live, work, and play. And this evening, we're privileged, of course, to hear a lecture on a very important topic. My name is Andrew Petter, and I'm the president of Simon Fraser University, and I'm just delighted that we could uh, welcome this many people to the first lecture in this year's President's Faculty Lecture Series. Uh, we're delighted to be back at the Shadbolt Center for the Arts for what promises to be an evening of big ideas and some very stimulating discussion. As most of you, I hope, know, SFU this year is celebrating our 50th anniversary. It's a slight sign of it back here. Um, at the same time, we're also confirming our vision to be Canada's most community-engaged research university. And the President's Faculty Lecture Series is very much part of that vision. Uh, it's part of a signature initiative called SFU Public Square, where we really want to bring to the community the opportunity to engage on important issues uh, with the community. By providing you with opportunities to hear from and engage with SFU's leading research faculty, these lectures are designed to foster enlightenment and promote dialogue on key issues of public interest. There'll be a chance to raise some questions and offer some comments after the lecture. And you're also welcome, uh, following that, to continue the conversation at a reception to follow. We've got some sumptuous coffee and cookies for you. Um, also, if you happen to miss the lecture, no one in this room, but if you know of others who do, it will be filmed and it's going to be available on our SFU YouTube channel. So I warn you, if you do ask a question, you might be on the channel. Uh, it's now my real pleasure to introduce tonight's uh, speaker, Dr. Krishna Pendiker. Krishna is a professor of economics at SFU and was recently awarded the 2016-17 William Lyon Mackenzie King Chair at Harvard University, a very prestigious visiting chair, which he'll take up next year. Thankfully, it's, it's a visiting chair, so he'll be back at SFU, I hope. He studied sociology uh, and economics at the University of British Columbia. He earned his PhD in economics at the University of California, Berkeley, and he joined the SFU economics department in 1994. Krishna's various research interests include consumer demand, econometrics, the measurement of well-being, poverty, discrimination, and economic inequality in Canada and in the world. And he's published extensively on these themes and is currently associate editor of the Journal of Business and Economic Statistics. From 2007 to 2013, uh, Krishna was co-director of a very important project in Canada, the Metrop Metropolis British Columbia Center of Excellence for Research on Immigration and Diversity, which was based both at UBC and at SFU. Metropolis was an interdisciplinary policy research center which connected roughly 100 academic researchers with over 100 policy-interested individuals in government and NGO communities. Through Metropolis, Krishna and his collaborators produced a wide body of research into the econo economics of immigration and integration that's helped to broaden the understanding of Canada's emerging immigration policy issues. And boy, are those issues no more important today, uh, no more important than ever, ever than they are today. He's current recipient of the Shirk Insight Grant Unobserved Variables in Consumer Demand. And in his own words, Krishna's goal is to document the economic trials faced by those living in poverty in order to, quote, help the poor redistribute income and create a society where everyone has the chance to be happy. Uh, that, of course, very much relates to the topic of tonight's talk, what does inequality really mean in Canada? 99% of us want to know. We're very fortunate to have Dr. Pendiker with us this evening to share his insights on this topic. So please join with me in welcoming Dr. Krishna Pendiker. Krishna. Thanks for coming. It's, uh, you know, weeknight and uh, economics, uh, but you all came. It's very nice. So uh, I'm going to talk about inequality this evening. And uh, I'm wondering, anybody buy that big book by Piketty? 
capitalism in the 21st century? No takers. <laughs> a few. OK, hands up if you, if you bought it. If you bought, come on, come on, come on. Hands up still if you read it. <laughs> so it's kind of an interesting thing that this 600-page book on economics, kind of a technical book, really long, became a bestseller. 100,000 copies were sold. At 10 euros each royalty, Mr. Piketty is sitting on a pretty penny. So um, the reason, there are a bunch of reasons. Uh, one is really timeliness. He's talking about inequality in a world that's become dramatically more unequal over the last 40 years. And um, one of the things that he did in his work, uh, really pioneering work, is he established that this isn't just a tiny part of the world. This isn't just his native France. This is all across the world, all different countries, developing countries, rich countries. Um, it's also within countries. Uh, it's a really wide-ranging phenomena that's uh, come to be really important and different from the past. So what he did in that book was he brought uh, a new kind of data to the table. He brought administrative data from tax records. It sounds really cool. <laughs> uh, but what, what, what this allowed was um, comparison over very long periods of time, like 100 years in the United States, 300 years in France. So really long time span and lots of comparable stuff to look across countries. So this new kind of data that he brought to the table allowed us to think about inequality in, in comparative ways that were simply not possible before. Another nifty thing about this new kind of data is it allowed you to study the very rich. Normal, so if you think about, well, the kind of data that I spend most of my time with, it's uh, sample surveys where you maybe, like a pollster, ask you know, a few thousand people stuff about their lives. But if you ask a few thousand people stuff about their lives, you're not going to get any really rich people or any really poor people. Rich people don't pick up their phone. Their staff picks up the phone. <laughs> poor people might not have them. So um, to learn about the very rich, these, this new kind of data was really important. And another feature of this new data source was the ability to learn about wealth. Uh, and that's because in some countries, uh, people have to file information with tax authorities about their wealth. And there's a difference between income and wealth. Income is the amount of money that flows to you in a year or a month or something like that. Wealth is the stock of money you've got lying around. Uh, and it's, it's, it can earn money for you. It also provides you a bunch of insurance. It's a distinct concept, and, was a, a, and we could talk about it distinctly with these new kind of data. Being able to look at data that go back 100 years also allows you to look at kind of big picture historical stuff that uh, much uh, modern data or uh, more commonplace data from uh, other types of data sources do not allow you to talk about in, in any real way. So what I want to do today is I want to talk about what, what findings were delivered to us by Thomas Piketty. The second thing I want to talk about is uh, in, in what ways are Canada uh, different from what Piketty is telling us for the world as a whole? And in what ways are, is it the same? And then the last thing I want to talk about is what policy tools do we collectively have to change uh, what the market economy is delivering us? And last thing I'm going to talk about today is it's election season. I'll tell you what the three main political parties are proposing to do about it. So uh, first thing is uh, this picture. So I'm going to show you, this is going to be you know, a lot of pictures. It's going to be a lot of this kind of thing, graphs. How many people here love graphs? <laughs> hey, you're my kind of people. <laughs> so uh, and the rest of you, I, uh, there are going to be a few words. <laughs> uh, enjoy them when they get, when they get there. So, uh, I went to graduate school in the uh, early 90s, and uh, you know, data always arrives with a lag. And this is the kind, this, uh, I'm not even going to name the axes yet. This is a picture of inequality over time. And you know, this is 1980, and that, when I was in graduate school, we kind of looked back, and we kind of thought inequality went down. That's what we thought it did. 
Uh, you know, countries get richer, they can afford more equality in some sense. So uh, this picture, which maps time from 1910 to 1980, and here it maps the share of total income in the economy that goes to the uh, highest income 1% of the population. So if you uh, imagine a mythical economy of fairyland where where everyone gets the same income, in that economy, the richest 1% of people would get 1% of the income. Uh, in the United States in 1910, the richest 1% got 18% of the income. And so you can read this, uh, this number as kind of like, you know, what multiple of their population share are they getting as their income share. These guys were getting eight times, 18 times, the fair share of the economy. This is an inequality measure. If the rich have, if the top 1% have 18%, then all the everybody else, the 99, have only 82%. So it's unequal. The bigger is that number, the more unequal it is. So this picture shows you that uh, from 1910 through to about 1940, the top percent in the United States had something like 16, 18% of all income in the economy. And then we have the cataclysm of depression, well, the cataclysm of world war and depression and world war, and an enormous drop in that fraction of income going to the top percent. It dropped from like 18%-ish uh, in the early part of the century to more like 8%. Uh, roughly for the period 1950 to 1980. That is an enormous change. Right? It's like taking 10% of the economy away from the richest and scattering it around the rest. So, uh, well, so that's what it looked like. That's what uh, things looked like uh, when I went to school. And then the last three decades happened. So this is the same picture. It's just extended from 1980 to 2010. And what you see is that this, this fraction, the amount of income going to the top percent, has gone from 8% back up to 18%. So this is another enormous change. Um, that's the solution. And, and we've been working on it. Um, <laughs> but. Um, I'll get there to policy. Uh, so, at this, so this is one measure of inequality, and it's one I'm going to focus on a lot this evening, this top percent share idea. Um, but there's lots of other ways to think about inequality. Um, Joe Stiglitz has a new book called, uh-oh, called something that's actually referred to at the very end of the presentation. There's a list of <laughs> things. Um, and uh, he notes that the... CEO pay ratio, which is the ratio of chief, chief executive officer pay to line worker pay within a firm, went from roughly 50 in 1980 to roughly 300 now. That's in the United States. So that's an enormous increase in the relative compensation of C, the CEO class relative to everybody else. Another uh, way to think about what it means to have the top 1% increase their share by 10 percentage points, which happened since 1980 in the United States. Um, during a period when economic growth was pretty slow, is to note that between 1979 and 2007, so that is up to just before the, the Great Recession, the top percent absorbed half of all the income growth in the United States over those two decades, three decades. So there's an economic pie that's getting bigger and bigger and bigger, but all that growth, well, half of that growth is going to just this sliver of the population. Between 2009 and 2012, that is during the period of growth after the Great Recession, um, they, they absorbed almost all of it. So, so this is what they mean by like a, a jobless growth uh, you know, in, in the United States, or uh, they mean that, yeah, there's a bunch of economic growth, but it's all accruing to this uh, tiny group of people. So 
Uh, now, you might, it kind of matters in some sense, the, the degree to which you want to get really mad at these guys or the degree to which you kind of think, oh, well, good on you, uh, depends on whether you think these guys are kind of superstars who like, uh, you know, invent things that we all use or trademark things that we all use and make us want them, um, uh, or, or whether they're these guys uh, who, who basically just kind of, uh, you know, look after their serfs and... Um, uh, I, I really think I would make a, an excellent British country gentleman. Um, so, uh, when we think about our aristocrats, um, it's not really about income, it's, it's about wealth. It's about the stock of money that they piled up. And more importantly, that previous generations have piled up for them. So, um, when we turn to wealth inequality, the French have the best data. Um, and so this is going back from 1810 to 2010. And uh, this lower line here is the fraction of all wealth in the economy that is owned by the wealthiest 1% of people. If wealth were distributed equally, that fraction would be 1%. But in France, throughout the period of, uh, you know, French aristocratic types, um, it was roughly half, 50 times their population share. Half of all wealth was in the hands of the 1%. Um, and then, after, again, there was this big decline over the first part of the 20th century, and we see that that wealth share dropped by an order of magnitude, dropped from 50% to 20%. So that's a pretty big change. And um, if you ask, you know, how, uh, how does this happen? Partly it's related to the uh, difference between the amount of wealth in the economy and the amount of income in the economy. So income, roughly speaking, comes from labor, from work, and from money that accrues to capital, you know, stock returns and interest on your bonds and stuff like that. So you got your, 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 uh, your big pile of wealth generating income, you got your big pile of labor generating income, and this is a picture of the relative size of the total amount of wealth compared to the total amount of income in a year. And the key thing here is to note that wealth, throughout that same period where, where wealth was a really, was super unequally distributed, at, throughout that period, you also had tons and tons of wealth in the economy relative to the amount of income produced in that economy. And then in the first half of the 20th century, that ratio shrunk in large measure because the income produced in the economy got bigger. And then after 1950, we see kind of wealth making a comeback or capital making a comeback. Now the reason that worried Piketty is that uh, as wealth piles up and as wealth is very unequally distributed, you're going to end up with some families that have enormous stocks of wealth to hand on to future generations, which generates uh, uh, a, uh, a society based on inheritance and aristocracy, and is kind of the opposite of a meritocratic society. So this is what bugged him, and the evidence for that is give, that he gives here, just focus on this part up to 2000, because this part's kind of all made up. Um, but what he found is that up here we have the total amount of bequesting in the economy. And it was super high because all these, you know, prior to 1910 or so, the wealthy in France were high, uh, had uh, a huge amount of the wealth of the nation and it was concentrated in a very small number of hands and they were bequesting it a lot. 
So bequests amounted to 20% of national income, of the total income in the economy, every year, but then it dropped to like 8% in mid-century. So this drop in the importance of inheritance and bequests is, happened at the same time that capital was kind of less important in the economy, as income was less unequally distributed, and then started to wear off. So it's interesting, I think, to note that, it's, that in inheritances and bequests started rising again a little before 1980, more like 1950, and then started rising a lot after 1980. So this is the kind of worrisome scenario that, uh, that uh, came to Piketty's mind and that he elaborated on for 600 pages. Uh, I got a good deal here. Um, the story goes that, um, so who's heard of R bigger than G? That's kind of a thing, it's a meme. It's not much of a meme. Uh, okay. Um, no problem. Uh, so, uh, R bigger than G simply means that the, the rate of return to capital or wealth, as opposed to labor, the rate of return to wealth exceeds the growth rate of the economy. And in that kind of situation, wealth is growing faster than income. And since wealth is distributed super unequally, that means wealth inequality will be rising. But since people get some of their income, especially the very rich, from their wealth, from the economic return of their wealth, that means income inequality is going to be rising at the same time. But additionally, because the very rich don't really spend all their money, if you're a billionaire, it's hard to find the time to spend it. So what they do is they tend to save it and leave it to their children. And so their children have this stock of wealth that's passed to them, and then they grow it some more. So Piketty believed that essentially we have a return to patrimonial society, to uh, a society that's essentially an aristocracy dominated by inherited wealth supported by capitalism. So one, uh, there's a set of interesting questions. One is kind of like, why did inequality fall in mid-century? Um, and um, there's a, a, a set of things that all happened at once, so it's hard to parse out a little bit. But one thing that happened is that through the Great Depression, uh, the bottom 99% kind of mobilized and had real power in politics. And that enabled countries like the United States, which were towers of inequality in the early part of the century, to reorganize themselves completely to be much more egalitarian. So you had a whole raft of egalitarian policies around education and wages and unions um, and taxation that were all aimed at equality. I'm going to come back to this uh, later. We also had in that same period very rapid growth because it was a time of great technical innovation. And in particular, it was technical innovation that favored uh, skilled blue collar workers. So uh, this is like Fordism and Taylorism, this mass production using skilled blue collar labor in factories. Um, by the way, you know you've made it as an academic if you have an ism after your name. And um, I strive. <laughs> so uh, Piketty's line is not without um, complainers. Um, and uh, one of the big uh, things that there is to complain about is that Piketty's view is driven entirely by, uh, well, his, the book is called Capital in the 21st Century. And his view is that capital and wealth are most of the story. And that's somewhat true for Europe, but uh, in the United States, uh, you know, there's this Snapchat billionaire. You know, he didn't inherit it. He just made up, anybody use Snapchat? Not, not the Snapchat crowd, yeah. Dude's a billionaire. 
Um, so uh, in the United States, over the last 40 years, a lot of the uh, increase in the top percent share is driven, in fact, by labor income, not by uh, the return to wealth. But uh, it's been noted that you can save your labor income, too. Um, so it doesn't undo the story, but it does kind of make it a little different if you're earning a billion dollars as opposed to making a billion dollars from the $20 billion your parents gave you, <laughs> like the Koch brothers. Um, oh, wait a minute. I think I could get caught on that. I'm not sure how much they inherited. They inherited a good chunk, though. Um, oh, I do have a good joke. Uh, Anybody know how to be as rich as Donald, how to be richer than Donald Trump? Thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> inherit as much money as Donald Trump and put it in an index fund. Uh, uh, yeah, okay. I'll t I'll t I, I got a million of them. Um, so, uh, okay, we go. So now I want to move to uh, thinking about Canada. Um, you know, I've been talking about France and the U.S. and you know, how, interested, how interesting are those places. Um, the U.S. is interesting in part because it's uh, so big. It's our neighbor, and they're rich, um, and they're like uh, an extreme case. You know, they, they had this 18% to 8% to 18%. These are very big changes. We're talking about taking a tenth of the economy and ripping it out of the grasp of the rich and putting it elsewhere. Um, so... This uh, black dotted line is uh, that same thing reproduced. And the red dotted line uh, right beside it or running through it is the analogous figure for Canada. Um, so what you might notice is that, so you've got 1920 to 2010, and you've got the income share of the top percent going up, up the vertical axis. And you notice that Canada and the United States really tracked each other till 1980. And in fact, the, the, United, the United States had a lower top percent share um, for much of mid-century than did Canada. But you know, they're, they're kind of in each other's ballpark for the, through the, throughout that period. And that, I think, is in large measure because both countries experienced these cataclysms and political changes um, prior to 1950. And both countries reorganized themselves. Um, and then around about 1980, both countries started uh, a path of increasing concentration of income in the hands of the rich. However, the Canadian one is more moderate than the American one. You know, it's a very, yeah, it's very Canadian. Um, <laughs> and uh, the increase here from 1980 to 2010 in Canada is roughly 5 or 6% increase in the income share of the top percent in comparison with 10% in the United States. So we had something like half the growth in this top percent share in Canada. It's not that the rich didn't get wealthier. This is a picture of uh, wealth inequality in Canada from 1970 to 2005, the measure on the left is no longer the top 1% share. Uh, it's an inequality index called the Gini coefficient. And you're going to see a few Gini coefficients. So I'll just kind of, I won't tell you anything more than it goes from 0 to 1. And uh, when it's 0, uh, there's perfect equality. And when it's 1, one dude has everything and everyone else has nothing. The scale of this thing is, uh, has the following feel. A 0.1 change or difference in the Gini index is like the difference in inequality in Canada the United States. Their Gini index is, a little, is almost 0.1 higher than ours for income. And it's like the difference between the Canadian the inequality of Canadian incomes and inequality of Swedish incomes. The Gini index in Canada is about 0.1 higher than the Gini index in Sweden. So uh, this thing goes from 0.68 to 0.775. So that whole span 
is 0.1. So that whole span is the distance between Canada and the US, medium -y country and super unequal country, or the distance between Sweden and us, super equal country and us country. So that's, that's how to read the scale of this thing. This right here tells you that the Gini coefficient for wealth went up about 0.05 since not between 1977 and 2005. 0.05, as I said, is like half the distance between Canada and the US. So this is a, a pretty big change in wealth inequality in Canada. Um, and yet we see this kind of moderated uh, change in top income shares. It's not nothing. 5% of the economy went into their hands. Um, this I want to take you back to the 1%, the 1% the income share, but I want you to think about uh, what it's like in different parts of the world. So um, here's the United States. Um, you may, those of you who are nitpickers uh, might notice that the United States is now above 20. These are slightly different because they're computed to be comparable across all these countries. But uh, they're, they're comparable across all these countries. And the blue guy, uh, a little colorblind, but this guy, the high guy, is the United States. There's Canada and the United Kingdom. And there's France and Japan. And uh, what this tells you is that everybody was super unequal. Before the, before the 30s. And then everybody was super equal uh, up to the 80s. But then not everybody had an enormous increase in the top in, in the income, share, income shares of the rich. And in particular, France and Japan, it's kind of still, you know, 7 to 9% from 1945 all the way to the present. So, that's a kind of a funny thing, because it means that although France and Japan definitely live in the capitalist world economy in which we live, but somehow those countries have quite different outcomes when it comes to the top income shares. Here I got Gini coefficients again. These are the things that go from zero to one. One is the most inequality, zeros, the, the no inequality, and a 0.1 change is kind of the, the distance between Canada and the United States. Uh, I only want you to look at the top line and the bottom line. The top line uh, is the Gini coefficient for income inequality in Canada, and that's gross income. Gross, the total income that the household gets is before you pay any taxes, uh, before anything, it's just a, the total. It's the amount that's irrelevant to you because you don't get to eat it, but um, it's there. And uh, this uh, index went from like 0.36 to 0.45 uh, over the period uh, 1976 to 1996. That's eight percentage points. That's almost the distance between Canada and the United States. So gross income inequality in Canada increased a really lot between 1976 and 1996. The bottom is the Gini index for net incomes after taxes and transfers. So government, you, you get a bunch of money, government takes a bunch, but it also sends a bunch back. So uh, this is kind of the tax system trying to undo uh, inequality. And what you see is that this was essentially stable from 1976 to 1996. Gross income inequality rose, but net income after taxes and transfers didn't. So that's, that's a big deal, right? That tells you that, um, you know, to the extent that we want our tax and transfer system to undo inequality, it totally did. Enormous increase in market income inequality, no increase in uh, after tax after transfer inequality. Unfortunately, that's the story ending in 1996. After 1996, we see very little change in gross income inequality. Any, the 
degree to which the market di in dis distribution of income was unequal was pretty stable for uh, the 15 years from 96 to 2011. But um, the net income distribution got more unequal. The tax and transfer system became less efficient at undoing inequality over the last 15 years. So uh, this, sh uh, I, I hope, makes you think uh, two things. One is, uh, yeah, we're embedded in a world economy, uh, but different countries have different kinds of outcomes. And two, uh, we used to be able to undo increased market income inequality, uh, but, but then we stopped. I think I said this. So uh, now I want to talk about, uh, I've sort of, a, you know, you're kind of a sympathetic crowd. You probably mostly think a ton of inequality is a little bit bad. Anybody here, anybody here like think it's, so, okay. Uh, well, I'm going to make the case anyway. I want to make the case that um, inequality has some bad consequences. Um, and that more inequality is kind of a bad thing for us. So uh, the first case I'm going to make is that mobility and inequality are connected. And by mobility, I mean uh, the ability of people to move up the socioeconomic ladder, uh, either over their lifetime or from generation to generation. I also want to talk about uh, education and inequality, because we tend to think of education as the tool with which people can increase their own incomes. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, all of this in the context of uh, intergenerational transmission of inequality. I mean, aristocracy is really bad if only the aristocrat's children get to have good lives. So the extent to which rich parents have rich children is kind of important. I'm going to talk a little bit about firm level equality, inequality as well, and finally a bit about unions. And then after that, I'm going to talk about policies to undo it. So a bit of context here is, this is my income pie. Uh, a bit of context is that uh, we, we live in a kind of a social, political, and economic uh, environment that, that we ourselves collectively construct. Okay? And uh, there, there are many players in this environment. They're all kind of fighting each other with each other or cooperating with each other or whatever to try and get stuff for themselves. And I like to think of a little quadranted pie looking thing of uh, we got owners and shareholders. Uh, we got operators and managers. That's the CEO, CFO class. We got consumers and we got workers. And lots of individual people might be all of these things, or some of them. But you have this tension of power relationships between these groups. Um, and one thing that seems to be the case is that over the last 40 years, or maybe 50, that the relative power of some of these groups have changed. Operators and managers are more able to extract resources from firms than they used to be. Owners and shareholders are more able to run firms that exploit consumers than they used to be. And workers have lost uh, a lot. Uh, so when you think about the kinds of policies we have, you want to kind of think big when you're thinking about policy tools that are available. Um, and, and think about this context of potential players to empower and disempower. So this right here um, is uh, uh, a comparison of different countries. And uh, so yeah, now I got two directions, but I'll get you there. Um, this right here is uh, income inequality as measured by the Gini coefficient. Um, the thing that goes from 0 to 100 in this case is just scaled by 100. 
And um, you've got uh, some countries that are, have super low Gini coefficients, like the Scandinavian countries, and some countries with super high Gini coefficients, like the United States, and some countries in the middle. Um, and then over here, you've got uh, what Miles Korak calls the generational earnings elasticity. And that, what that means is um, the degree to which having a rich parent ensures that you yourself will be rich. If this number is high, then having a rich parent is totally the way to go. And if this number is low, then it doesn't matter if you have a rich parent. You're just going to be making it or not making it on your own. So this line uh, tries to express the fact that the countries that have a lot of income inequality also have a lot of intergenerational persistence in economic outcomes. That is to say, the United States has the most inequality, but it also has the highest degree to which it's really important to have a rich parent if you want to be rich. I mean, the most important decision you can make in your life is the decision to have rich parents. <laughs> Um, another, uh, uh, you know, we commonly use education or, or think of ed education as a tool to undo inequality. Um, and so what, what we got here is the college earnings premium. This is the ratio of income that a person with a bachelor's degree would have relative to a person with a high school diploma. So uh, if that ratio is high, then having a university degree is worth a lot of money. And if this ratio is low, it's, eh, you know, it's all right. Um, and then over here, we have the generational earnings elasticity again. And again, we see these Scandinavian countries where you hardly make any more money if you uh, go and get a university degree. Uh, those are the countries where it doesn't matter who your parents are in the determination of your own uh, income. And in contrast, you have the United States and the United Kingdom where the return to education is relative, uh, relatively high. In those places, the uh, uh, persistence of income attainments across generations is, is very high. So this is, uh, this is just speaking to the United States and Canada. This is, this, I want to speak directly to what I was just talking about, like how important is it to have uh, a rich, uh, in my case, a rich father. So this is um, the, I'll just describe this one. This bar tells you, in the vertical, tells you the fraction of the sons of fathers who are in the richest tenth of all fathers, the fraction of their kids who are in the richest tenth of all kids. If that fraction was one-tenth, then there'd be no persistence, because you'd have like an even shot. But that fraction in the United States is 25%. So they have two and a half times the chance of uh, being in the richest tenth as you know, kind of other kids. And in Canada, that's less. So just as Canada has a smaller concentration of income in the top percent, we also have a smaller degree to which being in that top group of families is super important to you yourself in your future being in the top group of families. And it turned out that this period, uh, this mid-century period where inequality was low, workers had a large share of overall productivity growth, and uh, the uh, share of the 1% was relatively low, was also a period in which the US Congress was kind of cooperative looking. It's a weird statement, isn't it? I mean, what is that even? Um, and then uh, after 1980, or really mostly after the late 1980s, you have this big increase in polarization. And so this suggests that political polarization is connected with economic inequality. So um, I want to spend uh, a few minutes, maybe eight minutes, on, uh, on kind of what can we do about this. I mean, I did show you that picture uh, a while ago that showed you that even though inequality in Canada was rising, 
from the 70s to the 90s, gross income inequality was rising, net income inequality was, was not changing. And that is because the tax transfer system was undoing that increase. Um, so uh, the tax system and the transfer system are both pretty important here. So the key things to note here are that in Canada, tax rates have been declining since the late 1990s. It's been hip for all provincial and federal government parties to talk about tax cuts. Taxation supports public spending. If you want to spend a dollar, then you've got to get a dollar as the public. And where do you get the dollar? You get it from you. <laughs> so um, taxation supports public spending, but public spending, for the most part, takes the form of things that are received by people on sort of a per capita basis. Like, some people are very unlucky and have enormous health problems, and they get to receive a lot of health expenses. But from an insurance standpoint, everybody's provided the same kind of money value of health insurance. So that's an example of a very large component of public spending that lands on people in a very equal way. Public education is another example of this kind of public spending. Um, public spending also, uh, another way we spend money is we write a lot of checks. The federal government writes a ton of checks to people, especially elderly people, but also some non-elderly people, that is, people who have children. Um, and so if you reduce the amount of tax revenue by cutting tax rates, as we have done for the last 15 years or more, um, you are going to reduce the amount of public spending, which is an equalizing kind of thing to do. So we just kind of, there's a sense in which tax cuts, cuts are generically regressive. The word regressive means um, disequalizing. The word progressive means equalizing in this context. So the personal income tax system, which you're probably familiar with, uh, the one where, you know, you fill out your little forms or computer software and maybe you get something back or maybe you don't, is somewhat progressive because the tax rates for lower income people are lower than the tax rates for higher income people. But personal income taxes are only kind of a small-ish part of the revenues of government. They also get uh, income from taxing capital, that is, the returns on your stocks or the income from your bonds. But capital income uh, is taxed much less than is labor income and accrues to the rich much more than labor income. So capital income taxation, because it's taxed low and flows to the rich, uh, is pretty regressive in Canada. We also have consumption taxes, uh, which are quite low compared to Europe, um, and which are slightly progressive. Um, and Canada has no luxury taxes to speak of. I mean, if you want to equalize, you could tax the things that rich people buy, a Learjet tax. Um, but we don't, we don't really do that. Um, so these tools are, are kind of broadly available. Those are kind of administrative public policy tools that you can use to change the distribution of income. Um, if you want a more equal distribution of income, throw money at the bottom and take it from the top. We have the technology. Taxing the 1% is a touch harder because um, they're, you know, rich enough to be a little bit, you know, they got some money to spend to save their money. So um, it turns out that taxing the labor and capital income of the very rich uh, is possible, but you have to accept the fact that um, the amount, the reported tax base of the rich responds to the degree to which you try to take it from them. The more you want to take it from them, the more they hide it. And so um, it's, it's not that we can't get anything, but it is the case that if you raise taxes on the rich by four percentage points, as the liberals are proposing to do, you're not going to get four percentage points more money out of them. You probably get something like two and a half. Still something. Corporate taxation is even worse um, 
especially for provinces, because corporate uh, firms can just up and move. They can play location games, they can play accounting games. Um, they have a lot of tools at their disposal to uh, stop you from taking their money. So corporate taxation is in some measure a, a losing game. So any guesses? Who has higher corporate? Uh-oh, I've screwed it up. I'm going to cover this up. <laughs> Who has higher corporate tax rates, Sweden or the United States? The United States. The United States has uh, nominal corporate tax rates in excess of 30%. Sweden has effective ta corporate tax rates of zero. They got out of the game. Like if you're Sweden and, and someone can move their shipping company to Denmark and it's only one kilometer, um, <laughs> you know. So uh, property taxation is another uh, way that governments get money. Um, and unlike firms, land doesn't move. And so uh, it doesn't have this problem of, uh, in fact, it's the classical uh, immobile uh, thing to tax. Um, and it turns out that in British Columbia, uh, property taxes are uh, slightly progressive because we have this homeowner's grant thing. Uh, it's a thing. The point is it's possible to have uh, a property tax system that is progressive. They have quite a, a, a much more progressive one in the UK. The other thing to note about property taxation is that it's very small. This is an essential, essentially an unexploited uh, tax base. It, it's about 5% of revenue in British Columbia. Um, transfers, I mentioned, are like negative taxes. So, uh, you know, we can take from the rich, but we can also write checks to the poor, and we can do so very easily and very efficiently in the sense that um, uh, when Canada Revenue Agency wants to write someone a check, they are able to do so with like 97% probability. And it's because all the, all the people who don't pay taxes, which is roughly 20% uh, of uh, households, actually still let Canada Revenue Agency know they're there because Canada Revenue Agency sends them money. So Canada Revenue Agency is able to write people checks even if you think they might be hard to find. They're not hard to find because they want to be found. Um, and we have a lot of these things, like several kinds of child benefits, lots of uh, benefits to the elderly, um, and um, they are tools that we can use to equalize the after-tax distribution of income. But all of this is like, in some sense, overly focusing on what the government can do to uh, kind of uh, take it as given gross income distribution, right? So the, the world is one of increasing, in, increasing inequality, and, and you might just feel like, oh, well, that's just the way it is. The gross income distribution is going to have more and more billionaires, and, and uh, that's, that's just our world. And it's true that economists typically focus on, you know, what we can do with the gross income distribution to turn it into a friendlier net income distribution. But it, it's also the case that, that we can rebalance the... Uh, powers in that power struggle in my economic pie. Because all production occurs in a context, a legal and social context. And we have the power to affect that thing. We did so collectively um, in the 1930s and 40s and had a really big effect. Um, so we might choose to strengthen workers or strengthen owners or strengthen consumers. Um, these are all uh, policy tools that are available, uh, but uh, consumers and workers, we've been kind of uh, moving away from empowering them for the last 20 years, maybe 30. Um, we can also uh, raise minimum wages, and of course that won't do anything to the top percent share, but if you're worried about kind of inequality writ large, minimum wages have um, a fair amount of power to affect the distribution of income at the bottom. Um, they also affect uh, people's well-being through a different channel, one that economists don't often pay attention to, and that is um, lots of people, not all people, but lots of people are happier having a job that pays them in comparison to not having a job and having a dole that pays them. Um, and so that, that's an extra benefit. I mean, you, you might be able to uh, improve... Uh, 
improve the incomes at the bottom of the inc income distribution and also make people a little bit happier. This is kind of economics heresy a little bit because labor is supposed to be you know, bad, money's good, but anyway, I'll live with it. Um, another thing that uh, we can do to affect the gross income distribution is to uh, tax bequests. In fact, the United States has more bequest taxation than does Canada. Um, uh, so, yes, g go for a death tax. That's what we need. Um, so, education uh, is a tool that we can use to uh, uh, increase people's incomes. And we, we use education a lot as a distributional tool in Canada because we provide it to everybody kind of roughly equally. Um, so, it's equalizing at its, in its provision. But it's also the case that it's heavily subsidized, even in post-secondary education. So the level of subsidy varies across province, um, but it's between a half and two-thirds subsidized by the state for post-secondary. Um, so it might be that plentiful, high-quality K-12 and post-secondary education could make a difference. And we don't, you know, when you're thinking about a social experiment like that, we don't have a lot of data, right? Because what I'm talking about is taking the entire country and uh, increasing our uh, attention and monetary commitment to education. But it is the case that the United Kingdom massively increased post-secondary participation rates in the 1990s. And uh, you might think that if you massively increase the number of college graduates, that there'd be kind of like too much supply, and those college graduates might not do as well as they used to do. But in fact, they massively increased the number of college graduates, and I mean by a factor of like two and a half, and the return to education didn't change. So it was kind of a win-win. I mean, it's a pretty expensive thing to do, but uh, workers were made richer as a consequence. And this is kind of, this idea is blowing against the wind here. Is that the right? Pushing against the wind? Windmill? Something. There's some metaphor that has wind and a windmill. Assume I use the right one, QED. Uh, British Columbia has steadily shifted spe public spending away from education and into healthcare since 2000. And it's, it's very radical. I mean, we spend the least per student on K-12. to We have the lowest paid teachers. We have the high, largest classrooms. We're uh, trailblazers. <laughs> um, but, you know, I've only got two slides, so don't cut me off. Uh, uh, I, I just want to say a couple of things before I turn to what the parties are proposing. Um, and that is that uh, Canada currently has electoral spending limits. And we should treasure these things. Because um, uh, it's very easy to observe what happens if you don't have spending limits. Uh, the United States uh, lives in an environment with constant, enormous spending on electioneering. Um, and uh, it. it it moves us from a world in which you might think you have one vote per person to a world in which you might think you have one vote per dollar. And um, that world just doesn't seem as nice. So basically what I'm arguing is that um, you know, in the late 30s and 1940s, we reimagined our social contract uh, in, in favor of workers and consumers and the middle class and below. And it, it was a big deal because in order to do that, we had to take from the rich and redistribute it in a really radical way. You know, 35% unemployment for uh, five or six years kind of mobilized people. Um, but this is, this is essentially, I think, what we need to do again. Um, and this is not just, you know, a bunch of tinkering with your little taxes and transfers. Probably helps, but it's not going to get us back to uh, the, the good old days um, when uh, uh, income was equally distributed among white Americans. So, um, <laughs> so let, me, let me just speak to the political parties. Um, I will only talk about, uh, I will leave out the, the Bloc and the Greens and the uh, uh, Canadian Communist Party, Marxist Lenis, and the Canadian Communist Party, what's the other one? Uh, there are two of them, which I think is cool, um, because, you know, you don't want to aggregate too much voting. Uh, 
So the conservatives uh, basically act as if um, make a bigger pie and everyone will get more pie. Or enough people will get more pie. Or pie will fall down and some people will eventually get some pie. <laughs> so now it's not without merit. So um, you know, uh, in Alberta, uh, throughout the big pie expansion, um, uh, you know, skilled blue collar workers really did have really high earnings. So this idea that um, expanding the pie as your first order of business um, can be a good thing, that there's, you know, there's some truth to that. However, um, the bulk of the return to the pie expansion went to the top one or two percent in Canada. So there's some trickle down, but not that much. And they don't really propose to do much uh, different. I mean, you know, that they're running on their record. And their record is, uh, you know, low taxation to the extent that is possible. And connected with that is low public spending. But as I've argued, that's uh, uh, less equalizing than higher taxation and higher public spending. Um, and th they do so in the hopes that having low taxation will lead to greater expansion of the economic pie. Um, the liberals uh, are, are, are talking about kind of uh, borrowing some money in the short term to invest in social infrastructure, including uh, housing, transportation, um, and childcare. They're proposing to increase the Guaranteed Income Supplement. Guaranteed Income Supplement is a program that delivers money into the hands of low-income elderly people. It super works, um, and, and, and they want to make it a little bit bigger. It works because, essentially, uh, in Canada, we have essentially eliminated elderly poverty. And we did it by writing them checks. So they want to write them some more checks. Um, they want to have a they want to unify the child benefit system and have slight, I don't know, you know, kind of 15% larger uh, child benefits for low, the lower half or so of the population. Um, and they want to lower the implicit tax rates on them. Because if you get a child benefit and then you earn some more money, they take back some of the child benefit. So the liberals want to reduce the rate at which they take that back. They want to raise the personal income tax on incomes over 200,000. That is roughly the 1% uh, from 29% federally to 33%. So that's four percentage points, which I mentioned before. And that's going to get them something like two, two and a half percent of all that income above 200,000 held by these uh, folks. And with that revenue, um, they're proposing to lower personal income tax rates in the second bracket, so that's going to reach roughly 50% of people from 22 to 20.5%. You can see that tacking 4% on the rich does not allow you to reduce the tax burden by the middle by 4%. It's probably not even going to allow them to do this, right? Probably three quarters of a percent or 1% is funded by um, that tax increase. The New Democrats want to reduce small business tax rates, but increase corporate tax rates. So that's kind of like small versus large businesses. And they want to tax stock options. These are really their revenue measures. But as I mentioned, corporate taxation is, is tough. You, you often don't get the revenue you think. They want to have a national subsidized child care program. This is big because they want to take something that costs roughly $70 a day to deliver, and they want to charge you $15 a day. Multiply that by all the children. It's a lot of dollars. So it's a big program, uh, potentially highly equalizing, and it's something they've got in mind for the long term. They want national universal drug coverage. Again, uh, your Medicare doesn't pay for drugs. Um, but uh, they would have a national uh, program that did. So that also would be somewhat big. Drugs are about a quarter of all healthcare expenditures. So this is, you know, it's like another bit of insurance delivered equally to every person. It's highly equalizing, but again, 
kind of long term. They're proposing roughly the same thing to the guaranteed income supplement. And uh, they want to increase the minimum wage for federal workers, which is roughly 100,000 people. So, so that's, that's them. And then this is a list of where everything came from. <laughs> Plus some things that are just good. So you can uh, double click this at some point. Thank you very much. Wow, what a lot of information. I'd like to thank uh, Krishna for providing us a fine example of pendicarism. <laughs> so you've made it. Which is the ability to it. act out using hand gestures, complex social and economic trends. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> also for spitting against the wind and tilting at windmills, which I think was <laughs> your conflation of two things that you definitely did in this presentation. There is some time now for some comments or questions, and uh, Heather is going to grab a microphone so we can capture your thoughts uh, on tape for, for the webcast. Uh, if anyone has a comment or a question, uh, we're not going to have a lot of time, so I'd encourage you to be bold and get your hand up now. Uh-oh, there's a colleague of yours back there, but I think we'll go here first. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. right there. I need the microphone, though. Here. Hello, good, good talk. So one, my, one of my questions is, uh, you, you uh, gave a nice summary of the conservative side of uh, this uh, economics picture. Are there, what country would you point to that represents that mode of operation over the longest period? Would, have they been successful in, is there any such country? Or the US would be a good one? Or um, yeah, the uh, US is, um, also, so yes, the U.S. is a good example, but the U.S. additionally has a bunch of political uh, distortion that makes it so there's not exactly free market capitalism. It's kind of a big, giant, interest group-dominated capitalism. But it still does have this flavor of, well, you know, I mean, the U.S. has... Uh, really, really grown and uh, countered ex expectations of its demise for a pretty long time. So they're incredibly productive. And it, you know, that's a real thing. So I'm going to warn you, this next question is coming from an economist. So we've got an economist on an economist. So you guys are going to have to make sure that you don't just, you know, get into theorems and stuff and make it all real no. clear. No, you don't need to worry about that. It's <laughs> way too late in the day. No, just a quick question. A lot of talk about inequality. Uh, you didn't say anything about poverty. And I, I was just wondering, what was happening to poverty trends during the same period as the inequality stuff in Canada? And maybe pick your favorite uh, measure of poverty. Uh, yeah, I should totally know that since I have a paper on that. <laughs> um, could tell you if we had Wi-Fi. Um, so roughly speaking, um, poverty rates, um, let me just think this through. In the period in which inequality, uh, net income inequality was roughly stable in Canada from the late 70s to the mid 90s, uh, poverty rates were declining in that period. And then after that, poverty rates kind of slow uh, rose uh, up to the early 2000s and then started declining again. So, um, you know, basically low unemployment rates are, are really good for poverty. And um, Canada had kind of high unemployment in the 90s and then quite high in the early 2000s and then really lower for a long time. So boats sometimes rise and sometimes decline in a rising tide. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Over here. Um, what impact do you think the Trans-Pacific Partnership will have on income inequality in Canada? There's <laughs> uh, an easy question. Uh, yeah. You know, unfortunately, I'm not the guy. Uh, I don't really, I don't really know. Um, 
Yeah, I don't know. So we do know some things about, uh, about trade. So the NAFTA uh, and the, and the Canada-US free trade agreement, which preceded it, um, is associated with like an increase in economic activity in Canada. Um, so it, it was not just the case that uh, um, you know they stole all our stuff or uh, all the work went south, uh, because when you uh, engage in these trade agreements, there's kind of two things happening. One is uh, they can sell your their stuff to you, and you might not want your own stuff anymore, which is the uh, uh, part that pushes down local employment, but you can also sell to them and that can push up local employment. But additionally, you have the gains from trade that kind of uh, have a small increase in overall economic activity. So that's speaking to the pie. That's not speaking to the distribution of that pie. And I don't really know uh, much about the latter. What else? Well, the microphone is coming over here. There's someone here. Maybe I'll just ask a question. In your chart, uh, Krishna, you didn't talk about one policy instrument that's being debated in the, in the election, and that's income splitting. Do you want to comment on income splitting and, and its impact? <laughs> so uh, income splitting is awful. Um, so, uh, so there's in income splitting for the elderly, and then there's in income splitting for the non-elderly. Income splitting for the elderly is a relatively uh, older policy. Uh, income splitting for the non-elderly is new, just this was the first year. And uh, what it says is that um, if you have children, and uh, if those children have two parents, and if one of those parents earns a lot more than the other, then they can transfer income from rich to less rich parent, thus lowering the overall tax burden uh, of that household. So uh, why is this awful? Um, it's just weirdly targeted. Why do we love unequal income dual, dual parent households with children more than single parent households, uh, equal income dual parent households? Uh, it's, it's, it's a ridiculous, cynical. Ri <laughs> they wrote me a check. It, it's ridiculous. <laughs> And next time you'll tell us what you really think. There's a question right here. Oh yeah, this is totally getting on YouTube. Oh well. I really, I held back all this time. <laughs> Go right ahead. Uh, so we heard that you've spent uh, some years uh, working with immigration. And uh, so what's the link between immigration and inequality? Uh, are these immigrants coming to grow the masses of the richer or the poorer or uh, how, how it works. Great. This is, this is great because we're test, norm, you know, we talk a lot about interdisciplinarity within the university and, and people from different disciplines should be able to connect them. We're now going to see if, if Krishna, within his own discipline, can connect two areas of his own expertise. I can try. It. and inequality. So um, there are kind of two things going on with migration. One is you got a, a bunch of people uh, rushing in, and they're they're going to enter the labor supply and be looking for the same jobs that everyone else is looking for. Um, so that might push down the wages of the of the locals. But the other thing that's going on is that the skills that those immigrants bring in might be uh, the sorts of skills that make everyone around them more productive. And that's going to push up everyone's income. So there's empirical evidence on this. And uh, it looks like it's kind of different across the distribution. And roughly speaking, the bottom fifth of the distribution of you know, locals um, get hurt. They lose. And all the rest gain. Um, and uh, so that suggests that if you want to have like 80% gaining and 20% losing, pretty good deal. And so if you want to have a lot of immigration, it might be sensible to figure out a way to compensate the losers so that the winners can win. Um, there's an additional wrinkle to this. That evidence is from migration to the United States, where much immigration is, uh, uh, about half of it 
is immigration with high school or less. Whereas in Canada, about half of the immigration is people with uh, post-secondary degrees. And so here, it's going to be um, even less losers and even more winners. But you still, I think, want to think about, um, you know, when you've got a policy tool like immigration that's a net gain, it's not a net gain for every, every individual, so you want to try and design the structure so that uh, the people who lose out don't feel so terrible about it. Write them a check. Take just a few more questions or comments if there are any. There's one back over here and then one up here. Hi. Um, I learned about your UBC and I'm glad I made it all the way from there to listen to you. Uh, also, with your last slide, you clarified to me who should I vote for. It will be the first time I vote in Canada. <laughs> <laughs> Um, you said that the income growth um, up until 1980, um, I'm not exact about the date, uh, that the 1% took 50% of it. Uh, I'm assuming correctly if I said that the other 50 were taken by the middle class or middle class and poor. Uh, so uh, that figure comes from the United States and it's it's the late 70s to the mid 2000s. And over that period, there was a large amount of economic growth. Half of it went to the top percent. The other half went to basically the 99th to the 50th percent, sorry, uh, from the just the next to the 1% to the middle. Um, and below the middle, uh, there, were, there was really no uh, real income increase at all in the United States. So roughly half the population has had no income growth since the late 70s. But my question is about the 50 percent. So 150 was taken of the income growth by the 1 percent until uh, 2007 or 2009. So the rest was taken by the 51 to 98, right? So and the then the, half the, the bottom the half of the distribution got nothing. It's not working for you. Bottom half got nothing? Yeah. The next 49% got about half. The top percent got about half. And where did the other half went? That's what I'm looking for. Of the, of the one. Oh. The third half. <laughs> we got it all figured out. Uh, well, let's go right next here, and then we'll take the one up here, and, and we'll try to bring it to a close. Yeah. Um, hi, Krishna. Thank you so much for giving the presentation. Um, I saw this uh, post come up, and I was actually a student of yours at SFU eight years ago. I totally remember. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and government uh -uh. economics, and it was a great class. Um, um, very, very like insightful uh, stuff. It was, it was really interesting. Um, I actually had a quick question regarding the tax-free savings account and how the different parties are using that, because I feel like maybe that is an instrument that might increase income distribution and wealth, or wealth distribution. So I was wondering what your thoughts are. So RRSPs and uh, registered retirement savings plans and tax-free savings accounts are uh, tools you can use to shelter some of your income from taxation. Um, uh, an RRSP, you uh, don't pay tax now, and you do pay tax later after it's expanded a bit with the fullness of time. Uh, a TFSA, you do pay tax now, and you don't pay tax later. From government standpoint, an RRSP is like savings, right? So from government standpoint, um, they're, they're giving you money now, and then you're going you're gonna to save it, and then they're going to give it back to you, you know, more fold. A TFSA, from government standpoint, is like borrowing because you're going to, they're going to get money from you now and then uh, they don't get it later, There's nothing. So um, TFSAs are burdening future governments uh, with the fact that they get no, they get no taxation from that 
uh, current investment. So from government standpoint, TFSAs are hideously irresponsible. <laughs> Sorry? T uh, consumption taxes are a different object, so they're awesome. Oh, yeah, yeah, blah, yeah. Okay, it's true enough. Um, so, uh, so, so that's how they differ from government standpoint. Um, from the point of view of inequality, essentially they're all subsidies for the rich. So they're disequalizing, but you might want them because they allow people to save cheaply for their own retirement, and then government doesn't have to write them a big GIS check. So um, they're, you know, so yeah. They're probably disequalizing, but probably also desirable. It's also good to uh, um, incentivize savings in general to the extent that uh, Canadian investors and borrowers need to borrow from other Canadians. And a borrower needs a saver. Gentlemen in front. Um, so uh, with your professional opinion, uh, who do you think we should vote for in order to uh, <laughs> reduce uh, poverty and inequality? Um, so uh, I'm hiding under this thing, <laughs> this thing is good. So the. The child benefit, so currently Canada has a lot of child benefits. They land on um, households that have low reported incomes. Um, the child benefits are all administered through the tax system, so they're really efficient at getting to their destination. Um, they can be large, so uh, child benefits uh, range, you know, at the bottom end of the income distribution range from two to three hundred dollars per child per month. This is real money. And they're proposing to raise them by about 15, 20%. Okay, so that's real money. The lowering the implicit tax rates on them is also good because putting people in a situation where uh, they're getting child benefits and they're able to support their family, uh, but they also know that if they earn 100 more dollars, they're only going to get to keep 20 of them, is just generically bad. So um, th that's a good thing. This is a moderately good thing um, because uh, the rich are horrendously undertaxed. Um, the GIS is a pretty good thing. So the GIS is shared across these. These two things are distinctly liberal. And the $15 minimum wage for federal workers is distinctly New Democrat. 100,000 workers out of uh, roughly uh, 18 million workers in total is a non-trivial number of people. And $15 uh, represents an average of about $1.80 per hour increase in wages for these guys. Many of them are scattered, you know, they're not all at the 10 bucks. And so that's, that's a real thing. Yeah. Yeah, they're federal workers. This is the problem, right? They're trying to find things that they are legally allowed to do. They, minimum wage law is provincial. They can't do it. Uh, healthcare, is, healthcare is uh, provincial. They can't touch it. But they can introduce a drug program. They, you know, so the, the federal government is quite constrained in the policy options that it has available. Um, this is probably not going to get them much money. This is probably a waste of money. Okay. <laughs> that enough for you? Oh, and, and, and these guys, uh, I don't think that there's nothing there. <laughs> so now we know what Krishna thinks, but of course, you have to think for yourself come election day. Um, Is your brain washed? <laughs> And we've had a lot of information to help you to, uh, to reach your own conclusions uh, on, on that and, and a lot more, a lot of, uh, a lot of, um, of cause for thought and inquiry and uh, a lot of information uh, for us to digest. I want, on behalf of all of you, thank Krishna Pandekar for just a fascinating walk through some very complex territory with and without visual aids. Um, thank you so very much on behalf of all of us, Krishna. Thanks for coming.